Do you watch Elder Scrolls Theory videos very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. Hey guys, in this video I'm going to break down the most epic and obscene Elder Scrolls theories to date. So put your knee pads on and get ready to go on an epic adventure into the definitive Elder Scrolls Theory Iceberg. Hey guys, welcome back to another theory video, and this time it's featuring the beautiful and expansive world of the Elder Scrolls franchise. If you're new to Iceberg videos, I'll give you a brief explanation here, but if you want a bit more detailed explanation, check out my definitive Fallout Theory Iceberg video. So basically at the top of the iceberg are the more simple theories. They're easier to grasp and you don't need much deep lore knowledge to follow along. But as we advance further down into the waters of the iceberg, prepare yourself for theories to become more intense and complex. So what is the Elder Scrolls franchise? Well sadly these days most people would probably only know the most recent of games, Skyrim. An absolute juggernaut in the gaming world, which had a massive cultural impact on how open world games should be made. But the Elder Scrolls goes much further back, with the first title being released in 1994 called The Elder Scrolls Arena. Released by the legendary Bethesda Game Studios, the game was a 2D dungeon crawler that gave players the freedom of creating a race and a class and exploring the massive world of Tamriel. The game was a first of its kind and it would later spawn sequels that have gone on to become some of the most critically acclaimed and enjoyed western RPGs of all time. These include Daggerfall, Battlespire, Redguard, and then on to the big ones as I like to call them. Morrowind, which began the new Elder Scrolls formula that so many people would fall in love with and single-handedly saved Bethesda from closing down, which then led to Oblivion and then onto the latest entry, Skyrim. The Elder Scrolls world is high fantasy full of magic, monsters, gods, dragons, elves, furry and scaly people, and prophecies that can foretell a grand or an abysmal future. The lore goes deep. Very, very deep. It can be extremely complicated for people that aren't familiarized with it, so I'll try to do my best to break it down in the simplest terms as I can. But I do have to put a disclaimer here that first of all, I'm not an Elder Scrolls lore master, and if you find someone who is, then hold them tight and let them know it'll all be okay. I'm probably going to make a few mistakes, so forgive me preemptively. Yes, lore is crazy complex. Second, we'll be going through spoilers in all the games, so here's your warning now. And lastly, some of these theories are based in pure conjecture and have no real basis, so we'll be skipping those ones. If you guys like Bethesda games or RPGs in general, then you're in the right place. Consider subscribing as we'll have more lore and theory videos on the way. Enough context, grab your sweet roll and a mug of milk and let's dive into the first tier of the Elder Scrolls Theory Iceberg. The Bosmer are Cannibals so the Bosmer, or Wood Elves, are a race of elves that primarily reside in the province of Valenwood. These elves rejected the traditions of their stuck-up cousins, the Altmeri, or the High Elves. They like to live a simple and a harmonious life with the land around them. Being quick and nimble is a must for them as they explore the forests and trees around them. But not only are they quick in body, they're also quick in the mind as well, as many of them pursue successful careers in trading and mercantile ship. Bosmer also live two to three times as long as humans, with a 200 year old Bosmer being old and a 300 year old Bosmer being very, very old. It's just unfortunate that these quick witted and good natured people are also cannibals. Yeah. Well, sort of. A lot of them are, yeah, but not in the way you think. Some Bosmer are known to follow a pact called the Treaty of the Frond and Leaf, or more commonly known as the Green Pact. It's a strict code in which the Bosmeri who follow it preserve the green and the nature around them. The green is what these followers refer to as their forest, and they will do anything to protect it from any harm. Now weirdly they don't consider non-Bosmeri as enemies to their pact, so basically a Nord per se could walk into the forest and cut their trees down and face zero consequences. In fact they would even buy this wood from these different races. So you're probably wondering at this point what this has to do with cannibalism. Well this is where the theory began its origins and most people who play the game read little lore snippets and start believing that all the Bosmer eat people. This comes from a mandate called the Meat Mandate within the Green Pact. 
proclaiming that all Bosmeri that follow this religion must eat their fallen enemies before three days pass. Yeah, pretty nasty. But here's the good news. This mandate was heavily followed in the past, but started to diminish in the second era, and now only the most remote and devoted societies still follow this specific mandate. So no, the Bosmer are not all cannibals. In fact, most of them aren't. That is, not anymore at least. If you want to read more about the Green Pact and all the interesting details within it, I'll leave a link below. Just remember, the next time you're in Valenwood, try not to dive too deep into the lush jungles. Dragons are really wyverns. <laughs> yes. This really is on the iceberg. I considered leaving it off, but some people on the internet really consider this one to be a hot topic. Some people get really fired up about it and they'll bring out the claws to defend their position. Basically, the theory suggests that all Skyrim's dragons are not actually dragons. No, they're actually wyverns. Now don't fly on to the next theory, this one won't last long, I promise. So what is the difference between a dragon and a wyvern? Well, the wyvern only has two legs and the dragon has four. That's really it. So yes, technically the dragons in Skyrim are wyverns. But are wyverns not a subset of dragons, making them still dragons? Now I know you'll want to gnash your teeth at me in the comments, so just be cool. But I'll say this in the defense of Skyrim and to play devil's advocate, the precise distinction of these two giant scaly flying lizards actually just comes from D&D. Because they basically needed a system to differentiate between the two types of dragons. Well, the multiple types of dragons. This is not representative of actual human history. In most historical documents, they refer to all big scaly reptiles as mostly dragons. If you don't believe me, then here's a medieval depiction of St. George slaying a dragon. Pretty much the home dragon slaying tale. As you can see in the picture, this dragon is definitely a wyvern in the D&D classification. So really, it's up for you to decide. Yes, they're wyverns, and yes, they're also dragons. But there's definitely one thing we can all agree on. If you killed Parthenax for the blades, then you're the real monster here. The insects in a jar. In Skyrim, you've probably run across some bugs. And no, not those crazy glitch bugs, I mean bugs that are captured in a jar. You probably thought it was just a cool little decoration that you could place in your newly built house in Falkreath. The five bugs in the jars are a bee, a moth, a butterfly, and a dragonfly, and a torch bug. Pretty cool, and they can all be found in the same locations on each playthrough. But if you took the time and really looked closer at these jars, you would actually discover that they had runes or scripts written on top of their lids. All of these runes being unique to one another, which threw fans into a flurry of trying to decipher their codes and the potential easter egg that may reward their endeavors. Theory after theory, speculation after speculation. Fans on Reddit and other social media sites began claiming that they had found the purpose of the jars and that they were all right. Some even claim for it to be part of the Illuminati. I would give you some examples, but I don't really need to. Why, you ask? Because the theory has already been debunked. No, not by some crazy tailwind adventure of running the math and calculating their true purpose. But actually by the YouTuber Camelworks. FYI, if you haven't seen his vids, go check them out. They're really awesome. But he basically just asked the developers straight up what the bug's purpose were, and unfortunately, it was the most boring of all the theories. They don't have a purpose. They did at one point, though. They were going to be a quest added into the game, but sadly the quest didn't make it into the final cut and we're just left with some jars with some bugs in them. Maybe this was a clever prank on Bethesda's part to leave them in the game. Maybe they wanted fans to run around looking for answers for something that didn't actually have one. But oh well, at least we got some cool decorations out of it, right? The drag once ruled the oceans. The Dreg are super interesting, and their lore is a little muddled, one could say. If you don't know what this race or creature is, here's a little excerpt that I'll read from the wiki. The Dreg or Dregs are a Tamrielic race of powerful aquatic creatures, observed primarily in Morrowind. They are often hunted for their wax and hide. Once common throughout Vardenfell, Ebonheart, and the surrounding waters, they have been driven into isolated pockets in more recent times. There is some doubt on whether they shouldn't be classified along with Argonians for their semi-aquatic nature and troglophiliac humanoid form. 
in their current form in the present they're mostly savage creatures that have no form of language and mostly exist as common animals there are two different types of dregs technically the ones that live on land and the ones that live in the sea the distinction is still pretty heavily debated though, some claiming that they're still the exact same species, but it's not confirmed. The interesting thing about the modern day Drig is that they seem to worship an idol or deity of some sorts, known as the Ruddy Man, the father of the Drig, which is believed to be either a manifestation of the Daedric Prince of Domination, Malag Bal, or one of the monsters born from the union of Vivek and Bal. Though there is some semblance of intelligence on their part, but what about in their past? Well, we do have some instances where the Dreg were actually referred to as a civilized and intelligent race in the past. In the Mythic Dawn commentaries written by Mankar Cameron, the leader of the Mythic Dawn cult, which worshipped the Daedric Prince Mehrunes Dagon, he says in Commentary 4, quote, The Mundex Tyrene was once ruled over solely by the tyrant Dreg kings, each to their own dominion and border wars fought between their slave oceans. They were akin to time totems of old, yet evil, and full of mockery and profane powers. No one that lived did so outside of their sufferance of the dregs." End quote. So basically suggesting that the dreg ruled over the seas as kings, and even further than that, the world. This is even reaffirmed in Vivek's lessons. Vivek is one of the three immortal god kings of Morrowind. He states that when the dregs ruled over the world, the Daedroth prince Malagbal had been their chief. He then describes the form Malagbal took at the time as spiny and armored and made for the sea. Sounds like the similar crustaceans known as the Dreg, does it not? So then what happened to them? How could they have devolved so far over time? Truth is, we don't know, but some theories suggest that because they are a war-focused race, they effectively destroy themselves between all their civil wars and then eventually devolve further when they're ravaged by the Dunmer or the Dark Elves for hunting them for their hides, wax, and eggs. Regardless, the main crab meat of this theory comes from Mankar Cameron, which in itself is shaky at best. I mean, he's a known cult leader and a liar. But then again, there are legends in Morrowind of people talking about the dreg having stone and coral houses in the sea and that they even farm mud crabs. So it's all up in the air at the moment but I'd personally love to see an aquatic race be added into the series to play as. Maybe the dreg regain their consciousness, or maybe it's the Altmer of the sea. Guess we'll have to wait and see. The Nerevarine is in Akavir. Alright, so these are two big words that a lot of people probably don't understand if they aren't ingrained into the lore, so I'll break them down super quick to give you an idea of what we're talking about. This is the first tier of the iceberg, so I think it's only right. The Nerevarine is the player character in Morrowind, and even more so than that, they're also the reincarnation of Indoril Nerevar. Yeah, that's right, another name you've never heard of. All I'll say is that Indoril is basically a hero of the Dunmer people that lived a long time ago and did a lot of good things a long time ago. Akavir, on the other hand, is a continent lying to the east of Tamriel. Separated by the Padomaic Ocean, it is the homeland of four seemingly unrelated races collectively referred to as the Akaviri. These races are composed of the Demons of Kamal, the Serpent Men of Saisi, the Monkey People of Tangmo, and the Tiger Dragons of the Kapo Toon. I probably butchered some of that, but hopefully, you know, I was right on track there. Who knows? Not much is known about the Akavir, and it's never been seen in game, but the Akaviri people have launched several assaults on Tamriel in past ages. So now that you know what we're kind of referencing, let's dive into the theory. The theory basically states that after the Nerevarine defeated Dagoth Ur at the end of Morrowind, they decided to travel to the land of Akavir. This comes from a little snippet in Oblivion, the game after Morrowind and before Skyrim. It states, Rumor has it that the Nerevarine has left Morrowind on an expedition to Akavir and has not been heard from since. And that's all we have, so I guess the bigger question is, why? Well, maybe the Nerevarine had known that the Akavir had attacked once before, and their landing point was first Morrowind, and maybe they figured that they would do a preemptive strike against the Akaviri to stop any conquests. There are also rumors of a dragon named Tosh Raka that lived in Akavir that planned to come back to Tamriel in a new invasion. So maybe the Nerevarine decided to head off that threat, and considering a new invasion by the Akavir hasn't been seen in 200 plus years, maybe they were pretty successful. Or at least successful in delaying them for a long time, but let's be honest here, the gods of Morrowind are dead, the empire has been fractured, dragons have returned, and the two greatest powers on the continent have exhausted themselves against each other. This may be the single best time for an Akaviri invasion. 
I would love to see them referenced or even part of the major plot in Elder Scrolls 6. <sighs> the long wait continues. All right, so that does it for tier one and we're sliding further into the miry depths of the iceberg. From this point on, I won't try to hold your hand as much and I'll expect you to know some of the names and places I'm referencing. If not, don't worry, I'll try to do my best to simplify things. I also have a ton of theories to go over, so I won't go as in depth as I have been, so we can make it through these in a timely manner. If there's a theory you want to hear more about, then leave it in the comments and maybe I'll make a future video on that theory specifically. With all that said, let's jump into tier 2. The Thalmor want to destroy reality. Now this theory right here can get extremely complex and delves into the deepest parts of Elder Scrolls lore. Simplifying it on my end won't be very easy, so if I miss something or leave something out that you think is important, just remember this is the most basic form of this theory. Like I said, if you want more details, then leave a comment and maybe I'll make a video on it. So if you're new to ES lore, you'll probably get lost in the sauce here, but I'll do my best. The Thalmor are the governing body of the Aldmeri Dominion. The Dominion is a union between the Somerset Isles, where the Altmer reside, Balinwood, where the Bosmer reside, and a few client states where the Khajiit live in elsewhere. The Thalmor are considered by most not in the Dominion as supremacists that want to reform the Aeliad Empire or even an Elven Empire instead of an Imperial one. So what about the theory? Well the theory originates in several locations. The first is Michael Kirkbride who made an offhand comment about the Thalmor agenda in a letter called the Altmeri Commentary on Talos. It states, quote, you come for me, have you? You think I don't know what you're up to? You think I can't destroy you? The power to unmake the world at my fingertips and you think you can do anything about it, end quote. Michael Kirkbride is the former senior writer at BGS and he's worked on all the lore for Elder Scrolls up until Skyrim. The problem with this, as you see, is that most of the Thalmor stuff didn't actually come to fruition until Skyrim came out. But maybe he had an idea of the future the series was going to go, or maybe it was just a comment not to be taken so seriously. Also, this commentary was never actually added into a game, so realistically people are latching onto something non-canon. The other place this theory stems from is just the fact that fans have created it, because it fits a good mold. Breaking it down in the simplest terms, there are multiple towers that exist in Tamriel. These towers basically create and hold the fabric of reality as it stands now. So their plan would be to destroy these towers and then thus the fabric of reality itself. But destroy might not be the right word. They may want to actually reshape reality in an image that they prefer instead. There is truly no proof that they want to unmake the world, but you could definitely argue it for them. They want to destroy the godhood of men. They want to reestablish an elven government over all of Tamriel. And they have no issues of making slaves of lesser races. I will say though that they did try and defend the Crystal Tower during the Oblivion Crisis. They ultimately failed, but they killed an insane amount of Daedra. Why would they care to do that if their ultimate goal was to reshape the world anyways? Regardless, there's a lot more info on the Towers and the Thalmor themselves that I didn't suss out. So go read up on them, it's pretty interesting. Also one last thing on the Thalmor before we move on. My personal theory is that they will be the main opposition in Elder Scrolls 6. I think a lot of people would agree. Who or what are the Ideal Masters? If you don't know, the Ideal Masters are the omnipotent beings that reside over the Soul Cairn. Some would say they are likened to gods, other more like demons making trades. Similar to Daedric Princes, they control the realm of the Soul Cairn and all the inhabitants that reside there. They are an enigma to the inhabitants of Tamriel and only those who make deals with them or have visited the Soul Cairn know of their existence. Most individuals who deal with the Masters are deceived and subsequently their souls are condemned to the Soul Cairn. While there are theories, exactly why the Ideal Masters crave souls is really unknown. They are known to trick anyone dealing with them, that includes Necromancers, to try and steal as many souls as they possibly can. A good example of this is the Dragon Dernavir that you can meet in the Soul Cairn in Skyrim. He tells you that he made a deal with the Masters to control legions of undead armies and all they asked is that he would guard the Cairn until a specific person died. Dernavir gladly agreed, but unfortunately for him, it turns out that the person is an immortal vampire that can never die, so he's forever trapped. Now this theory was pretty washed up when Skyrim was the latest entry around, but now currently thanks to Elder Scrolls Online we have actually learned who the Masters are. 
In the Lore Masters archive of the Maelstrom Part 1, it explains that the Ideal Masters were once mortals and formed an early order of sorcerers who practiced necromancy, trafficking in souls great, small, and fragmentary. They became very powerful and eventually found their physical forms to be unacceptably weak and limiting. They transcended these forms and became beings of soul energy. We don't exactly know who these sorcerers were, but what really matters is that we now know that they aren't Daedric or Adric beings. In fact, they're just mortals who transcended into crazy amounts of power. It almost seems pretty similar to the story of Talos in a way. Some theorize that the Masters could play a pivotal role in the next game as fierce adversaries, but that's all baseless. Would be cool though. Just make sure the next time you're trapping souls, you don't make a deal that you'll regret. Skyrim belongs to the Forsworn. This one is pretty simple, and we'll probably go through it pretty quick. I think the theory mostly comes from people believing that the Forsworn were owed Skyrim because the Nords displaced them in the Ethereum War. But the reality is, is that the Forsworn realistically only want the Reach back. They never controlled the full territory of Skyrim. Going even further beyond that, we could look back way further to see who Skyrim actually belongs to. You could say it's the Snow Elves, because they were the first ones here when the Otmorans landed all those centuries ago and then effectively got beaten back into the holes of the Dwemer. You could say it's the Dwemer, because they had created massive structures like Markarth and all those cities, but then they just disappeared. You could go back even further before the Dwemer and say it was the Dragon Cult in the Merithic era because they controlled the territory then. The point is, Skyrim doesn't belong to anyone and never has. It's just a revolving constituent of people or races that control the land at whatever time. But it especially doesn't belong to those filthy Forsworn, and not even the Reach. Go back to your caves with your witches and leave everyone else alone. Left-handed Elves Who are they and what do we know about them? Are they even still around? The Left-handed Elves, also known as the Sinistral Elves, were a race of elves from Yakuta. They were the enemies of the Yakutans, which were the ancient Red Guards, and fought long and bitter conflicts with them for thousands of years. Eventually, the Orichalc Tower being involved in their war games. They were said to have had a large empire. It also sounds like they sailed from the Somerset Isles to Yokuta, and that is where they derive from. There are no accounts on their appearance or even why anyone calls them the Left-Handed Elves. In ES lore though, the left hand is represented by strength, so maybe they got their name because of their strength? Really, it's all up in the air on that one. It is believed that Regatta, a Yakutan, had discovered the Prankata sword and consequently blew up the place, destroying Orichalc Tower and killing the Mur. Some Red Guards, of course, survived through it on the parts of Yakuta that didn't sink, but it seems the left-handed elves were all off then. Basically, the Yakutans destroyed every ounce of the Sinistral Elves and then made their way to the mainland. When they got to Hammerfell, they also destroyed all the Elvish settlements that existed there because of their hatred for these past Elves. The Red Guards, who are descendants of the Yakutans, hate them, calling that their darkest days. So I don't exactly know why the theory is on the iceberg, but maybe the theory is asking where they went and are they all really gone? I would say this sounds pretty likely, that they were all destroyed on Yakuta when it sank. And unless they learned how to swim or become aquatic in a few weeks, they didn't stand a chance. It is interesting to wonder if they would have looked like the Altmer, or a whole different Mer race. Khajiit Barbs. <laughs> uh, if you know, you know. This one I'm really going to get through fast because this is hella awkward and sounds like some of that Kirkbride crazy ass lore. Basically in Daggerfall, a little note on a little bookshelf explains that the Khajiit have little barbs on their, uh, scrolls, if you catch my drift. Apparently in real life, cats also have these barbs on their scrolls, and it can be hard and painful to read with these scrolls. What the hell is this theory? <laughs> well, the fanbase clung on to this theory and wouldn't let it remain obscure, because of course they wouldn't. So Douglas Goodall, a Marwin designer, retroactively changed the lore to say it was more of the animal Khajiit that had this trait and not the humanoid ones. Because the fans just wouldn't let it go. <laughs> Regardless, I'm absolutely done with this theory. Hasta la pasta, baby. Keep those scrolls away from me. Did the Dwemer ascend to Aetherius? 
Okay, so let's be real and be glad we got through that last theory. But this current theory we are on is basically where did the Dwemer disappear to? If it were up to me, I probably would have placed this theory on the very top of the iceberg or the very bottom. This theory is probably the most talked about theory in all of Elder Scrolls lore. It can go super deep. It could take a multitude of hours to actually explain it all and many people have done that several times on YouTube. But the real conclusion, no matter how many hours you dive into it, is always the same. We don't know. Nobody knows what actually happened, though there are many theories. But we know that it happened during the second battle of Red Mountain where Kagranak planned to use the profane tools Sunder, Keening, and Wraithguard on the heart of Lorcan found deep in the Red Mountain itself. At the very least, we know they're no longer on Tamriel, perhaps somewhere else in Mundus, though the spirits of some do remain, as well as the last dwarf, Yagram Bagarn, in the Elder Scrolls Morrowind, but even they don't know what happened to the rest of the Dwemer. As to whether or not we'll see the Dwemer alive in any other Elder Scrolls game or know what truly happened to them, it seems pretty unlikely as the Dwemer's disappearance is one of the greatest and captivating mysteries in all of the lore. The best theory that I've read so far is that the Dwemer and their souls are actually tied to their god. And I'll read a short brief of his theory here. It's a lot of salad words so be prepared to barely understand what I'm saying, but I'll leave a link to the theory below so you can go read all of it for yourself. Well, we look back to 1E700 when Kagranak, or whoever, struck Lorcan's heart the power source of Numidium. Keening's power caused a disturbance to the Brass God. A few other things could have happened. Numidium's burst of power could have killed all who worshipped it, the Dwemer. Numidium could have been injured as happened to Meridia in ESO Somerset's main quest causing all the Meridian worshippers who touched her remaining power to disappear into her realm. Daring Gautier and Dawnbreaker, for example. Numidium withdrew into itself, dragging the souls of the Dwemer in with it. And then some other crazy metaphysical stuff, I don't know. When Numidium is active, in use, or at least able to be functional, the Dwemer ghosts persist, bound to Numidium's soul as it were. Much like Arniel's shade is bound to the Dragonborn. However, Numidium was disassembled and made unusable after the warp in the west, before ESO, and so the Dwemer's souls were trapped within Numidium, dead god, no souls. When Akulakan was built in the third era, Morrowind, suddenly Numidium's power was revived, and so the Dwemer, shades, or souls could wander freely once more with their god in existence. However, the Nerevarine destroyed Akulakan, and so the Numidium's power was lost forever. If the Numidium is gone and the Dwemer souls are bound to it, then their souls are gone forever as well. End quote. Okay, so the too long didn't read version would be more like, the Dwemer built their god, worshipped it, which bound their souls to it. They vanished when Lorcan's heart was struck by Keening, causing a burst of divine power that tore their souls from their bodies, leaving Ash behind. This god, aka Numidium, was destroyed in later eras along with the Dwemer souls tied to it. So yeah, I told you it got deep, and I didn't even read half of his theory to you. But a lot of it makes sense and explains why the Dwemer aren't around during the events of Elder Scrolls Online. Anyways, the Dwemer stuff confuses me, and I'm glad we got past it. Gigalag is set to return soon. Okay, so there's two theories here that could work. One is that after the champion defeated Jigalag, he returned to the waters of Oblivion to rebuild his strength, form a new plane, since his original one is now Sheogorath, he may return someday. Though Nern is already a relatively structured and ordered place, so he may not see a need to deal with it for some time. The other is that Sheogorath and Jigalag are inexorably linked, and they cannot be separated at all. So, after the Grey March, Jig just faded back into the recesses of Sheogorath, awaiting another thousand years when a new Grey March would begin. I don't think the second theory holds up very well because Jig says he's free and he's gonna wander around the plains of Oblivion. But this does still mean that he could very well be powering up and preparing for round two on Tamriel. We also know that the cycle between him switching from Seogorath to Jigalag is finally broken because every time a Grey March occurred, Jig actually won. But then he was transformed back into Sheo for the cycle to repeat itself. Except this time, the champion beat Jigalag and the cycle was finally broken. So really, for the theory to have any real basis, we would have to consider that the cycle wasn't broken and his return would obviously be imminent with the Grey March. But as I explained before, the cycle is broken, so we really have no idea what Jigalag could be doing. 
I did always love the idea of a game where Jigalag was the main antagonist, marching into not only Tamriel, but all the other planes of Oblivion as well to assert his control. He loathes Chaos, and since the princes are basically the formation of Chaos itself, it would seem likely that he would plan to also rein them in if he could. Just imagine a game where you travel to different planes of Oblivion, helping out Daedric princes and trying to get their help in aiding Tamriel and Nern. That would definitely be an experience. Ooh, so that's it for tier 2. That was a massive one and we still have 3 more tiers to go. A lot of the theories from here on out don't have much in the way of uh, factual basis we'll say. <laughs> so hopefully they'll go quick because honestly there's not much to chew on unfortunately. But if you made it this far then I want to thank you. You guys are awesome and the type of people I want to build a community with. Anyways enough of the mushy stuff let's move on to tier 3. The Dragonborn chose to join Harkin. The only way this actually makes sense is if the Dragonborn needed the power of the Volcahar to stop Alduin, which they technically don't need, but would be a good reason for them to join Harkin. But what about the next game? What will they say the Dragonborn chose? Well, the Dawn Guard storyline is written in such a way that regardless of the side you chose, there's no real lasting effects. Harkin dies either way, and with him dies the tyranny of the Sun Prophecy. Whether the Volcahar die out or the Dawn Guard does doesn't really matter as the Volcahar agree to regress and go back to a quiet, shadowy existence, while the Dawn Guard would likely disband after Isran's death, given that the threat of the vampires is greatly diminished with the death of Morvarth and Harkin. But with this all said, it is a dragon's nature to try and reach out and secure power. It took Parthenax thousands of years of meditation and seclusion to overcome his desire for power. Lore-wise, the Dragonborn is no different than the dragons that roam the sky, only in physical body. So yeah, it would make a lot of sense for the Dragonborn to justify becoming immortal and more powerful. Anyways, I'm just speculating personally and that's not what this vid's about, so let's move on to the next one. Is Mephala the Night Mother? Mephala is the Daedric Prince of Secrets and Murder and is regarded as one of the three good princes worshipped by the Dunmer. She is also the patron god to the Morag Tong, an assassin guild that thrives in the Ashlands of Morrowind. The Morag Tong are also direct competitors and rivals to the Dark Brotherhood. So would their god really betray them and work behind their back as the matron for the Dark Brotherhood? Well of course she would. She's also a deity of betrayal and she enjoys interfering in mortal affairs. So is there any real basis for this theory I hear you saying? I'm glad to be the one to tell you that yes. Yes, there is. Some scholars have identified the Night Mother of the Dark Brotherhood, a rival cult of assassins, as a manifestation of Mayfala. In the book called The Sacred Witness, a man named Gorming explains that Mayfala appears as the Night Mother herself, whom the Brotherhood revered second only to Sithis. But there are other scholars who dispute this claim in the lore. It is an interesting theory though, and one could really surmise that Mephala splitting her followers in half and effectively pitting them against each other is one hell of a way to get some enjoyment. Is Sadia telling the truth? Do you remember the quest in Skyrim where you help two Alakir agents find someone and then help them bring her to justice? So yeah, this is about that quest and the theory suggests that maybe Sadia isn't lying to you when she tells you the story about her past. What if the Thalmar are trying the same thing they did with Skyrim in Hammerfell? In Hammerfell, there are the Crown and the Forebear factions which are nobility and soldier classes. What if one or a few of those, or even her own house, decides to start secretly working with the Thalmor to bring in the end to fighting? Thalmor are not so bad, we could have peas, blah 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 blah, trying to change the mind of others. Sadia, which is from a noble house, speaks out against this and then angers the people with the agenda. So they hire the Alakir to kill her so she doesn't interfere with the plan. She doesn't know who she can trust in Hammerfell, so she runs away. So in this scenario, Sadia is 100% telling the truth. She is from a noble house and the Alakir are working with the Thalmor through another faction in Hammerfell. She is being hunted because she spoke out against the Aldmeri Dominion and that angered the wrong people. On the other hand, if she did do what the Alakir expect her to have done, one could rebuttal the fact that if Sadia did betray the city for the Thalmor and she was a spy for them, then couldn't she have taken up refuge with them? They have a whole ass embassy in Skyrim. Now this is assuming that the Thalmor couldn't care less about some runaway spy. I mean they do torture anyone who goes against their agenda. 
But let's be real. She's most likely just a liar and honestly... Heimskira achieved Chim. Yeah, this theory is about this guy. In each of us, the future of Skyrim, the future of Tamriel. Achieving Godhood. And no, I'm not joking about this one either. <laughs> Achieving Chim is a whole process that would take a whole other video just to explain, so I'll give you a little rundown. Basically, what happens is this. There are people in a cave that have never left it. All their lives, they've been chained to a rock, their heads constantly facing a wall in front of them, never seeing anything but that wall. Behind them is a torch. This torch lights up the wall and casts shadows on it. People walking through the cave cast shadows on the wall, and the chained up people believe that they are real, going so far as to think some are better than others. And whoever can remember the most details about the shadows is considered to be greater than the rest of them. This goes on for a long time, eventually one of them breaks free from his chains and leaves the cave to see the outside world. He realizes that the shadows were nothing but that. Shadows. They weren't real. He saw what was real, and it was amazing. He goes back to the cave to tell the others what he saw, and none of them believe him, and they all laugh at him. So now back to Heimskir. He is the man who escaped. He preaches about what he saw, what he knows, and what do people do? They ridicule him. They laugh at him. Nobody takes him on. He's just a spectacle and an annoyance. But he escaped. And just how would you escape? You would break free and leave. This is Chim. You break free of your mortal ways and you see your world for what it really is, a dream. Heimskir escaped the dream. He saw it for what it was and he is ignored, laughed at, just like the man in the cave. But in all fairness, he does die pretty easy for achieving Chim. The towers are falling. This one kind of harkens back to the Thalmor theory that we went over. Basically, the idea is that all the towers that hold Mundus together are being destroyed or aka falling. For the uninitiated, a tower is a significant place that holds together Mundus. The tower stone is the source of that tower's power. The destruction of a tower stone is always bad. Usually stability in the region drops massively. Also, there's a prevalent theory that the reason the Thalmor are invading everywhere is because they want to destroy them to unravel Mundus, which they believe will return their lost immortality. So let's go over a list of all the known towers and their current statuses of their supposed stones. Now, these towers and their stones could be different, but this seems pretty right. The only one that might not be is the Throat of the World, as we know the stone could be a cave. The Somerset Isle and the Crystal Tower. The stone is destroyed. Valenwood and the green sap, it's deactivated. Elsewhere, the tower is unknown and the stone is lost. Black Marsh, the tower is unknown and the stone is unknown. Maybe it's the Menemic Egg, who knows. Morrowind, the Red Mountain, the stone is destroyed, which was the heart of Lorcan. Skyrim, the throat of the world, the stone is possibly destroyed. Maybe it was Parthenax, maybe it was Alduin, or maybe it's the cave. High Rock, the Adamantian Tower, it's still active. High Rock, the Numidium Tower, it has been destroyed. Yokuda, the Orichalc Tower, also destroyed. Cyrodiil, the White Gold Tower, and the stone is also destroyed. Small disclaimer here, this only works if you believe Kirkbride's lore still holds up and is being used, which a lot of people don't think is the case. I guess we'll see in the next game. I have a feeling that the Adamantium Tower, though, will play an important role in the future. Okay, so that tier went by pretty quick, and it was definitely a wacky one. Well, just prepare for it to get even more wacky as we head into our final two tiers. Thanks for sticking around so far. If you have, then you're a real one, and I appreciate it. The events of Elder Scrolls Online wiped out during a dragon break. So you probably need some context on what a dragon break is and what am I if not your faithful steward here to give you the information you desire. A dragon break, sometimes referred to as un time, is a temporal phenomenon that involves a splitting of the natural timeline which results in branching parallel realities where the same events occur differently or not at all. This results in a return to the non-linear timeline of the dawn era. At the end of a dragon break, the timeline reconnects, making all possibilities and outcomes truth. 
though contradictory to each other. Dragon in the name refers to Akatosh, the Dragon of Time. So basically when a dragon break actually occurs in the timeline, no one actually notices it and the timeline is changed forever. It's kind of a cop out for the devs, as it's like an omniscient retcon that can occur at any time they deem necessary. This came to be because of the ending of Daggerfall, Bethesda wanted to give the player the option for multiple endings. Rather than choose one specific ending as canon, Bethesda canonized all the endings and made them all truth by introducing the concept of the Dragon Break. So does ESL occur during a Dragon Break, leaving all the lore and events by the wayside? No! Matt Firor, the literal game director of ESO, did an interview during an Elsewhere press event and was asked this specific question. His response was, quote, No, it's canon. It's part of the world. Bethesda said that many times too. It's just, we're 700 years before Oblivion and almost 1,000 years before Skyrim. There's a lot of time for things to happen, but there is lore that there were dragons in Tamriel in between that point in the future and in Skyrim. It's just no one had ever talked about it. End quote. So yeah, ESO is not in a dragon break and never will be apparently. It is all canon and this theory can be laid to rest. RIP to the ESO haters. Is Cicero the adoring fan? The adoring fan. The man. The myth and the legend. Arguably one of the most famous characters in all of Elder Scrolls. Pretty hilarious, actually. Is this little clingy Bosmer still hanging around during the events of Skyrim? Is he still on a quest to find a champion to adore? To be the adored follower he always wished he was? He has no name. We don't know where he lives or what he does. Some would call him a man of mystery. And Cicero. The adoring fan of the Night Mother, one could say. The jester of murder. His laughter fills the halls of screaming victims and overpowers them. A true psycho who enjoys the thrill of sneaking up on his unsuspecting victims and driving his dagger through their... Sorry, got carried away there. We know a lot about Cicero, and we even know that he can be trusted according to the ghost of Lucian Lachance. And I always trust Lucian. The only thing Cicero can't do? Change a wheel. So is it even possible that they could be the same person? Is there even evidence to suggest such a thing? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Only one piece of evidence that I could find. You can find one of Cicero's journals in his room in the Falkyrie Sanctuary. While reading through it, it will be extremely easy to miss, so pay attention. In his very first volume, there is a paragraph at the end that states, quote, Completed the arena contract, I ultimately decided to pose as a Starstruck fan and immediately got into the Grand Champion's good graces. While escorting the arrogant fool through the Great Force, I slashed his throat and left the corpse for the bears." End quote. Well, pretty compelling, right? Right? Okay, it's foolish. For one, the dates are way off. Oblivion takes place in the year 433 in the Third Era, and Cicero Journal entry takes place in the year 186 of the Fourth Era. This doesn't necessarily debunk the theory because Bosmer can live for a long time, and maybe it's a different Grand Champion than the player character of Oblivion. Or maybe it is the player character who was also an elf. Am I really suggesting the Adoring Fan murdered the Champion of Cyrodiil? <laughs> no, no, not really. Okay, I'll just say the obvious. Cicero is an Imperial, so yeah. Kinda kills the theory right there. And I know that technically he could have somehow magically changed his appearance, but really, probably not. It's a fun theory though, and who doesn't love hearing about both of these characters? <laughs> just stab, 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 stab! And then, stab, 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 stab! The Thalmor are the good guys. No, they're not. The champion of Cyrodiil is not Sheogorath. It's really, really hard to argue the case for this theory, and honestly, I just don't think it holds up under any circumstance. One could say that it would be mad to do so. <laughs> I've done way too many puns this video, I'm so sorry. I've tried to find anything and everything suggesting that the CLC isn't in fact Sheogorath, but everything I found led me to the conclusion that they are and that it's pretty much canon at this point in time. The only thing I could find was that the mantling process is more complex than just assuming the role of the Mad God. 
and that maybe the CLC could still retain their own consciousness. But it's really messy and honestly not worth explaining all of it. If you guys know more about this one or you have your own theories as to why the champion may not be the Mad God, then leave them below because I'm pretty stumped. Other than, just don't do the quest, or simple things like that. <laughs> We also know that Sheogorath mentions being there during the Oblivion Crisis, which could once again be confirmation that they were the champion at some point. It's weird to think that when you're doing the quest in Skyrim and speaking to Crazy Ass, that it might actually be your character from all those years ago, staring back at you. All that nostalgia and all those memories, all reduced to one thing. Cheese. Wonderful! Celebration! Cheese! For everyone! Mistara is the Tenth Divine. So the Nine Divine are considered the good gods of the Elder Scrolls universe. Now that's a very simplistic way to look at them and they go way deeper than that. But they are called the Aedra and are basically worshipped by the majority of the population as benevolent beings. So who is Mistara? She's not known as one of the Nine Divine and probably most of you watching this video have never even heard of her. I know I hadn't. Well, there's a book and game titled Year 429 of the Third Era, 61st of the Reign of His Majesty Uriel VII, written by Brother Cadmius of the Order of Stendar. In this book, he describes that if you give enough coin to enough beggars or peasants, you'll hear a new name bless you from their lips, Mistara. According to Cadmius, he says that no one knows of this name, it isn't written in any books, and no scholars have spoken it. Only the poor dregs that have uttered the name to him on the streets. Years of complaints eventually led to an investigation by the Elder Council into what was termed heretical worship, in which dozens of layabouts, beggars, and loiterers from across Nibine were arrested and questioned. Though they said little of interest to the soldiers, the battle mages, or even the moth priests, several prisoners of various racial and provincial origins were, for whatever reason, willing to discuss their strange goddess with your humble author. It is assumed by most that Mistara is female, although one old Colovian woman refused to use any pronouns for her, claiming, Gods ain't got no need for them notions. Consistent among the shared belief of these beggars seems to be that Mistara is, or was, a divine, some calling her the tenth divine after Talos himself, and others still more brazenly declaring her as the ninth. This surprised Cadmius, because he assumed Mistara to be a Daedra of some sort. Here's the latest excerpt from his text that I find really compelling. I was unfortunately not able to press my questions for long, as the City Watch severely limited my interactions with the prisoners, and just days later released each and every one of them back to their homes, explaining that the entire incident had been a simple misunderstanding and that these dregs of society were worshippers of a poorly understood form of her benevolence, Mara. While this answer is a tempting and tidy solution, many of the responses I received from the dungeons that day continue to nag at me. Who is the Forgotten Goddess? Do the poor know a divine that the rest of the Empire's children cannot feel? It seems that whatever the truth may be, there is only one group you can ask who might, should they be generous, provide it. It's really interesting, and I think a lot of it is ambiguous on purpose. She's said to be a handmaiden and a tear wife of Shore, like Mara. She's also said to be married to a chief god, just Talos instead of Akatosh, Oriel, or Shore, just like Mara. She's linked to Nern by some believers, just like Mara. I even read that some people theorize she could be a mystical version of Meridia. Did the Elder Council eventually get tired of the ramblings of madmen and pardon them with a flimsy justification? Or did they let her worshippers go when they learned what she really was and cover it up to make the faith of the Nine happy? Did you guys even know that there was a potential Tenth Divine? Man, this lore is crazy. It really baffles me just how fleshed out this world really is. Is Vivek still alive? This is one that I think a lot of people still theorize about to this day. I think for sure that most accept the fact that he's not dead at all and that he actually just wandered off. While the deaths of Almalexi and Sothasil are well documented, it seems as if Vivek just disappeared. Vivek attained another level of alignment or connection to the Tower, the Universe, or the Godhead that the other two just did not achieve. Sothisil and Almalexia are canonically dead. Their false life, which was sustained for them for many centuries, ended with the actions of the Incarnate. Vivek's fate is uncertain. Nerevar Reborn did not have to slay him as part of their journey, and even if they had, the extra layer of royalty that Vivek wore would have likely persisted beyond the death of his body. 
He wouldn't have necessarily re-entered the Dream Sleeve to be born again like the other two. His mind is still there, on some level that's obscured to the people of Nern. He may have a part left in the great arc of this Kalpa as it unfolds, but it's possible it's a very subtle background role. And because Vivek did achieve Chim, that would technically mean that he couldn't die as well. Maybe his physical body, but definitely not his spirit or his ethereal power. Vivek is missing. There's no concrete information on what happened to him. One rumor says that the Nerevarine killed him. Another that he was carried off by Daedra during the Oblivion Crisis. Another that he simply left this world. No one knows for sure what happened to him. However, if we accept other sources, he basically stepped away from the world to do other things. He's Chim. He can't really die in a conventional sense, but he can just remove himself from other things. Once upon a time, the story was partying in Aetherius, and that's about the sense of it. He left to leave Mundus, Nern, and its people to carry on. Someday he may or will return when something interesting happens. So yeah, he isn't dead, but kinda is? I don't know. The Chim and Morrowind stuff is really hard to comprehend, and a lot of it can be taken as metaphors or just not concrete at all. So welcome to the last tier on the Elder Scrolls Theory Iceberg. Before we finish this off, I just have a few words that I want to say. First off, thank you guys so much for watching this far, I genuinely mean it. These videos take hours to make and honestly, I just do it as a hobby and for fun. I was so happy with how well the Fallout Theory video did that I had to make another theory video ASAP. And of course I jumped right to the Elder Scrolls. Oblivion was the reason I truly began gaming and this series is just my favorite of all time. These games hold a special place in my heart and I'm glad to share this enthusiasm with you guys. So if you guys enjoy communities that talk about these games and want to join a friendly place to chat about these things, then really consider subscribing and sticking around. I have a lot more video ideas in the works and I think you guys will really love it. Anyways, it's been a long road on the video, so let's just finish this thing off. Iridil is a lie. This one comes from the lore standpoint that Tiber Septum chained Cyrodiil from lush jungles to a fertile land with like plains and temperate forests. Then why the hell is it the exact same in the Elder Scrolls Online? And don't start with the lore is fluid and maybe ESO isn't exactly canon or that Tiber Septum can reshape the events of the past. Because that kind of ruins the fun of these theories. <laughs> Alright, it's really hard to argue the fact that Tiber Septum and his followers made up the Cyrodiil thing for propaganda. Because yes, Tiber Septum actually can reshape the events of the past, so when he changed Cyrodiil in the present, it also changed in the past. It's a really weird concept, but based on theories of realistic time travel, this actually makes more sense on that scale. Also, there are books in ESO that actually talk about the climate changing in the Heartlands. In Subtropical Cyrodiil, a speculation, the author suggests that there are several plants and weather effects that led to the idea that Cyrodiil was in fact a type of jungle in the past. It had a warmer climate, but after men rose up and defeated their elvish slave masters, the land around them changed over time based on their needs. Now this would be a really slow change and also means that Tyra Septum wasn't technically the one who changed it, but the reality is that Cyrodiil is in fact not a lie. At some point, it did go from a jungle to a temperate climate. The Third Moon The lunar legend that has mystified fans around the internet is one that talks about the Dark Moon, or the Third Moon, that exists in the Elder Scrolls world. We know that the moon actually exists in the lore. The Khajiit are shaped by the moons, but they believe only their manes can be formed by this Third Moon. So then, what exactly is the Third Moon, and why can't we see it all the time? Well, that's because this moon specifically only appears when both other moons eclipse the sun. The prevailing theory, at least between a lot of fans, is that the Dark Moon is actually part of the body of Lorcan himself. We haven't really dived into Lorcan too much, but a lot of these theories around the Dunmer and Mundus and Ethereum and a whole host of other things stem from him somehow. Lorcan, also known as the Doom Drum, is the elven name for the missing god, the deity most directly associated with the existence of the mortal plane, and is the god of all mortals. Some believe that the two moons, Maser and Secunda, are the two halves of Lorcan's body that was cleaved into two. This is mostly an empirical belief and is represented in a ton of the games, which is why a lot of people believe this to be true. But the Khajiit themselves certainly don't view the twin gods Joan and Jode as Lorcan's corpse. Elves certainly don't see that, for Joan and Jode are minor gods in their religion. Bosmer, for example, they represent good and bad luck. We also know that the Dark Moon is also the den of Lorcage. 
a shadowy realm created from the decaying corpse of Lorcage. It is at the end of the Two Moons Path the journey that the Khajiit must take to become the main. This realm is said to be a third moon, the Dark Moon, which governs the fate of Dromathar as Joan and Jod govern the fate of the Khajiit. Also, if you're getting confused, then it's really fine. <laughs> Lorcage is the Khajiit version of Lorcan, so here is where I'm getting with all this. The Khajiit believe that the two moons that are always present are the two different deities and not part of the Lorcan at all. They believe that the third moon is Lorcage, or his body anyways. And the biggest piece of evidence is the fact that this place can be visited on the Elder Scrolls Online during the events of the Reaper's March storyline. It's described as a rotting corpse by the loading screen that precedes it. Which is weird and gross, but here we are, and here are the main theories. So like I said, it's up to you to really know the full truth. Eleanor is an elf. This one is kind of dumb, and I contemplated just leaving it off, but I've already left off two theories in this tier because they're just so damn vague, and honestly, they just have no real basis to exist in my opinion. This one is kind of similar to those. Helena Whitestrake is the bane of all elves, renowned as the Divine Crusader. He was an immortal hero, legendary warrior, sorcerer, king, and crusader who fought as champion of the slave queen, Alessia. It is said that he literally emerged from the sea carried by Sithis himself. Described by Morehouse as an Ada or spirit, Pelino plays the same role as a long line of avatars sent by Shazar to champion the cause of mankind and stop the elves from destroying them. Pelino, however, is an exception as he exhibits significant bonds to Akatosh as well, as he had the Amulet of Kings in his chest in place of a heart. He slaughtered every single elf that stood before him. He was even slaying the Khajiit until they begged one of their gods, Alkosh, to literally come through time to stop this man. Pelino Whitestrake was insane. He didn't care for nuance or anything like that, only for killing elves, ravaging elsewhere for a time, because he literally mistook them for elves. Yeah, one would hear all that and go, you know what? This man sounds like an elf to me. So where does it come from? What could possibly make someone think this insane thought? Well, it's his name. His first name is Pelinol. It's a corruption of the name Pelinel, which means Star Maid Knight. He took the name despite it being Elvin. Or at least, that is honestly the only thing I could find. Pelinol's story and lore go pretty deep, and honestly, it's one of the most interesting lore reads you'll find if you're into that. I would love to make a video that goes deeper into the history, so if you're into that, then let me know. And if you're an elf, then just stay away from that specific video. Maik the Truth Teller Maik the Liar is a sprinting Khajiit who comments on the changes made within the world of the Elder Scrolls, like the addition of children in Skyrim. But does he serve an actual purpose in the lore? Given his seemingly immortality, he's been alive for hundreds of years and appearing in several games across the series, and omniscience, he comments on everything, and seeing as he has been dubbed the liar, who is he? And is he actually lying? The unfun truth is that he was put in the game as the dev's response to critics. He says things in reference to individual things fans or critics have said about the games he's in. You wish to become a lich? It's very easy, my friend. Simply find the heart of a lich, combine it with the tongue of a dragon, and cook it with the flesh of a well-ridden horse. This combination is certain to make you undead. That comes from Morrowind, which has no liches, dragons, or horses, all topics brought up by fans of Morrowind. So yes, he's lying to you because he's telling you things you need that you cannot actually find within the game, but maybe he's still telling the truth. If Maik told you he was a liar, is he telling the truth or is he lying? One cannot be the other, yet they are. It's a nice little paradox to think about. So the theory suggests that he's telling the truth, well yeah, he kinda is. He's breaking the fourth wall. So realistically, he's talking to you as the player, not your character in the game. In that context, he's actually telling you truths, but you're just unable to investigate them. Here's some quotes from him that I threw in from each game. Levitation is for fools. Why would we want to levitate? Once you are up high, there is nowhere to go but down. So much easier to get around these days. Not like the old days. Too much walking. Of course, nothing stops Maik from walking when he wants. Maik carries two weapons to be safe. 
What if one breaks? That would be most unlucky. Maik once walked to High Hrothgar. So many steps, he lost count. See? He's not lying. In fact, everything he says is pretty much the truth. I think. The Elder Scrolls don't exist. Karifa al Tahud is a Redguard Telvar armorer found in Daggerfall. She is a known conspiracist theory, and she's quoted as saying, The Elder Scrolls don't exist. The Moth Priest, Skuma Blind. Everyone knows that. Now, most of us know that she's wrong. We've seen the Elder Scrolls and we've actually used them before. But from her perspective, is she not wrong? She has never seen any, and most of the people in Tamriel have never seen any either. Their world is that of one that doesn't have Elder Scrolls in it. Some reference that Mundus and the reality around us in Tamriel is just a dream someone's having. The existence of thoughts and creation only. Here's a quote by Kirkbride on Elder Scrolls. Quote, You misinterpret the meaning of what Elder Scrolls are in the colloquial Tamrielic. When taken in this context, to write an Elder Scroll is to make history. A deeper meaning is meant too, but not very many laymen bother with that. Until a prophecy is fulfilled, the true contents of an Elder Scroll are malleable, hazy, uncertain. Only by the hero's action does it become true. The hero is literally the scribe of the next Elder Scroll, the one in which the prophecy has been fulfilled into a fixed point, negating its precursor." End quote. And here's a quote from some guy on the Beth Saw forums before they were taken down, and I find this quite elegant, honestly. Well, imagine that you're an omnipotent being that does not know it exists. Imagine you have fragmented yourself into many things smaller than yourself, in order to better understand yourself, all while not knowing that you exist. Now imagine you keep it in a notebook." End quote. So no, the scrolls don't exist until they're needed to exist, if that makes any sense. I know a lot of this stuff in this tier is really heavy and full of brain thought experiments, but that's just the truth of the matter. The Elder Scrolls are Adric prophecies of unknown origin and number, being simultaneously archives of both historic and future events. The number of scrolls is unknown, not because of their immense quantity, because the number itself is unknowable, as the scrolls do not exist in countable form. That is from the unofficial wiki. All of this leads into our very last theory and the reason for all this baseless conjecture and free thinking, and I believe it will all make sense once you understand that. Nothing is canon. So this one takes all the theories and all the lore that we've already discussed and really combines it to show just how much of an Elder Scrolls lore can be subjective. The world of Tess is written by multiple perspectives that all have different views on those things. They call this the unreliable narrator because it's almost impossible to know what the exact events were or are. We have multiple perspectives but each perspective has a slightly different view. Take for example, the Champion of Cyrodiil. Some perspectives would say that it was the Grey Fox that saved everyone from the Oblivion Crisis. Others would say that the Black Hand from the Dark Brotherhood. Or maybe it was the Grand Champion. Or maybe the Archmage. And so on and so forth. Then they introduced Dragon Breaks, which we already went over, so now they can mess with the timeline in a canon way and basically have the tools to retcon whatever they need to. A lot of people that study ES lore or even write for it have the understanding that this world is open source, one could say. You need to forget about what is and what isn't canon in the Elder Scrolls because everything is so fluid. It's not exactly what fans want to hear and some of you guys probably won't like the idea, but the truth is the truth. Nothing is really ultimately safe. They probably are, but never say never. The universe of ES doesn't belong to any one writer or any one thing. It is the collective of ideas that have created this world of chaos and beauty. Even we the fans can come up with our own interpretations and technically it's canon. Was your Dragonborn Khajiit? Well mine was a Nord. Guess what? They're both technically canon to two different people. Why else would we all be here if not to talk about all this great and crazy lore? So that's it. That's all I've got for now. Now this isn't all the secrets and wonders in the Elder Scrolls universe. This is just the iceberg of the most fascinating theories surrounding the game. It took me quite a while to research and write up the script for the video, so if you made it this far, then thank you, sincerely. You guys are the reason I keep doing these videos, and I love hearing from all of you. So I want to give a special thanks to the people who are already subbed and the ones who are going to sub. I'm really grateful for you guys. The Elder Scrolls are the reason that I do all of this. They were the first games to really blow my mind, and they helped me understand that I could live in other worlds. 
If you want to see more videos like this, then please leave a like and subscribe. It helps me know how to better foster a community of like-minded people like myself. Bethesda games and RPGs in general are what drive me to continue on in this crazy gaming community. So if you're like me, then stick around, because you can bet that I'll be making more videos similar to this one. The Elder Scrolls is beautiful and complex, just like its large fan base. The fans are the ones who write the histories of the heroes, and we look forward to the future of this franchise and the wonders that we will create.